Uh, so, Mr. Todd Nelson from uh, WGE, he's an associate principal at uh, uh, Northbrook, Illinois, headquarters for WGE, uh, Janet Technical Center, and uh, he leads our material practice. I'm from WGE too, so uh, I can say he leads our uh, uh, material practice, and he is going to present on a very interesting project for long term monitoring of bridge decks in Montana. Todd? Thanks, Thanks Mohammed. Hopefully, everybody can hear me. You hear me in the back. So, I, as Mohammed said, I'm going to talk about a very interesting project to me. Hopefully, you guys find this interesting as well. Uh, but Montana had uh, issues with a lot of transverse cracking on a lot of their bridge decks uh, back in 2008, 2017. And we were fortunate enough to get an applied research project for them, which started in late 2019. And part of that was uh, monitoring of one of their bridge decks as part of our investigation to figure out why uh, they had so many issues with transverse cracking, we actually got to monitor one of the bridge decks. And I'll, you know, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, as we go. But what was the problem? So the, the problem was associated with a transverse cracking and, and pretty severe transverse cracking with the, the spacing of the transverse cracks, um, sometimes uh, two to three feet apart. But in, in three or four cases, within a couple of years after the construction of the bridge, we actually got a through hole penetration in the deck. Now, uh, I don't typically want to see that in a couple of years after I build that deck, right? Um, nor 20 years down the road, right? So they had three or four of these decks that actually had penetrations, holes in it, all due to the transverse cracking. And, and, and one thing to note uh, here is that uh, on these two particular decks, the, the, the transverse bars are actually stacked on top of each other, bottom top mat, which led to the, the holes, but not the cause of the transverse cracking. But um, and then these, these bridge decks were mostly in the Alpine region, greater than 6,000 feet elevation. In the eastern part of Montana, they didn't see these issues. <laughs> for, for those who are, live in the eastern Montana. So this is another picture. This is another one they had a through hole penetration because of the uh, transverse cracking. The left is the top side, obviously. The right is the bottom side. Uh, you can see pretty severe transverse cracks spacing two, three, four feet apart. And underside, you can see uh, the two penetrations. Again, the bars are lined up top and bottom mat. And normally when I'm in uh, Montana and I see the nice, beautiful blue skies, it's a good thing, except when I see it through my bridge deck, right? So they had concerns, they had problems, they reached out to us, but you know, uh, we need some help understanding why. So we did a full investigation. We'll obviously concentrate more on the instrumentation part of this. We did document review, uh, which included a lot of the information related to each of the bridge decks. So when it was constructed, what mix design was used, span length, uh, bearing type, uh, location in the uh, geographic location, everything we could get about the bridge decks to hopefully try to correlate that to the performance of the bridge. Uh, we did field inspections, we'll talk about a little bit. We did instrumentation um, uh, on one bridge deck, uh, representative bridge deck. We did some laboratory testing uh, on representative Montana mixed designs, the mixed designs they typically use. And then we did uh, some finite element and we'll talk about that as well. So we did have the opportunity to look at 14 bridge decks. These were all bridge decks that they had classified as having uh, more transverse cracking than what, they're, what they typically see. Uh, so we did do crack mapping like we always do, right? We calculated cracking density and severity, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. Uh, we did a delamination survey, so your typical chain dragging of the entire bridge deck. Uh, we did ground penetrating radar uh, on the entire deck to determine cover, spacing, make sure it was constructed consistent with the, the drawings. We also did a combination more from an experimental uh, standpoint. We, we did drone surveys with infrared thermography. So we put the IR camera on the drone. We floated over the bridge deck with the idea we're trying to pick up delaminations and cracks. And we'll talk a little bit about what we found there. We took some cores, primarily over the cracks, so we could learn more about the cracks and also look at the mixed designs make sure they're consistent with what we think they should have been. And then review of all the bridge deck documentation associated with each one of those. And again, that's all of this, uh, the construction documents, span lengths, 
number of concrete placement locations, mixed designs, bearing types, everything we could get related to that bridge and documentation of quality control records as well. So we, we got all that, reviewed that, tried to correlate that information to the performance of the bridge deck. So I threw this slide in there. This is one example of how we uh, calculated, quantified the cracking characteristics of not only each bridge deck, but each span and each placement as well. And we, we assigned a visual rating to each bridge deck, each span. Um, and then uh, we calculated a cracking density, which I call it. And uh, that's essentially the cracking frequency. How many cracks do you get per area? It's sort of informative, but we took it a step further and crack severity. So in addition to how frequent or how wide were those cracks? And that's important from not only trying to figure out what's going on, but also when we repair it, right? So if we have a high frequency, but the crack widths are tight, we might repair it differently than if our cracking severity, meaning the cracks are wide apart, but they're, um, they're far apart, but the cracks are wide. We, we, were, we, we would repair that differently than something that's um, uh, got a high frequency, but tight cracks. And the, briefly talk about this picture. So once we assign the visual rating, you know, this is sort of what we call the three. Uh, th this crack here is actually very important. Uh, and I won't go into a lot of detail about why that's important, but th that's the crack which I identified as a jump crack, which leads, eventually leads to the whole penetrations of the deck. So that's a crack that jumps from one transverse bar to the next transverse bar. And then when you have a situation where those, um, uh, those bars line up, you get those hole penetration. So this is a typical crack map from one of our bridge decks to give you an idea of what we're looking at. This is actually um, uh, 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 a deliverable from our uh, in-house software we have. So we have software where we can record field data uh, crack locations, core locations, photographs, all that. But this, uh, this type of drawing can be spit out from our software and of importance on here is, is kind of this area actually. So we've got a lot of tightly spaced cracks and, and what I call this jump crack as well. We do have a longitudinal crack on this one, somewhat of an anomaly, but uh, didn't really contribute to what we were looking at. So how about our drone surveys and our IR surveys? So. We, we took our drones out right as the, same, the sun came up in the morning. Uh, and we're trying to get that deck as it starts to heat up right away in the morning. Put the drone on the, or put the IR camera on the drone. We drove it along the length of the bridge. Not only we recorded IR, but we also recorded video and photographs as well. Uh, but believe it or not, we were able to pick up cracks as tight as five mils. And in this bridge deck, there are five to 10 mils uh, throughout the bridge, deck, very new bridge, actually. Uh, and you can see them here. Um, uh, Post-processing, we could pick up those cracks. And uh, with that data, we can, we can calculate that crack density, right? So we could calculate the frequency, but we can't calculate the severity. So it's only useful to some extent, but we were fairly happy with the idea we could pick up these cracks, to be honest with you. Uh, we didn't pick up any delaminations, by the way, <laughs> which, which was a good thing. And, and not all that surprising considering it's, these bridge decks were less than eight years old. So uh, we wouldn't expect any corrosion induced delaminations yet. Um, so in summary of our field inspections, uh, found no delaminations. Uh, the transverse cracks were always aligned with the reinforcing steel, somewhat expected, right? That's the path of least resistance when, when, when we have volumetric changes. And more importantly, this is kind of a long sentence, but we didn't find any trends, uh, any correlations of the, the cracking severity as it relates to the, the bearing type, the span length, uh, the placement location, uh, placement length, um, which are a little bit surprising. You know, a lot of times we'll see uh, more cracks uh, in the negative moment region compared to the positive moment region and all those sorts of things. But there was no solid correlations in terms of what they were seeing. But we did, we did identify some of the cracks as being very early age. When I say very early age, it might be different than other people, but when I say very early age, they likely occurred between 
four hours and 14 days after placement. And I'll talk a little bit why, uh, why that is. Um, and then we saw some indication of later age, age development of those cracks as well. And how did we determine that? Two ways, one, communications with Montana staff as they were building these bridge decks and their, and their monitoring of the bridge deck. But two, we, we extracted these cores over the cracks. And when we do that, we can get a general indication when that crack warped. And that was useful to provide information to us to identify when that crack occurred. Um, and then ultimately uh, understand why. So the instrumentation, we, 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 we installed instrumentation uh, on a bridge deck in the Alpine region. This was close to Butte. Uh, it was done in the winter. Um, but this, all this instrumentation, instrumentation was installed prior to construction of the bridge deck because we wanted to capture um, the early age internal strains, the early age temperatures, the early age relative humidity. So we installed vibrating wire strain gauges, thermocouples, thermistors in this deck, internal relative humidity, which is not often done in bridge decks, but we got some very useful information. We also had a weather station out there because we felt weather was a major influence on these transverse cracks. So we had a weather station out there monitored temperature, uh, wind speed, re ambient relative humidity, solar radiation, which all that information was used later in the modeling, which we'll talk about. Um, very, very interesting stuff, very, very fascinating to me. So this shows a, a plan view of the bridge deck that we instrumented, and we, uh, we instrumented placement location seven. Uh, a lot of bridge decks are placed in multiple placements, just like this one was um, we, we had strategic uh, goals with using placement seven, but this deck, as you can see, the alternate placement locations, and that's pretty common practice. Um, but we did placement seven and we had four monitoring. These four red dots represent four monitoring locations. And we selected those locations, excuse me, based on uh, the, the level of restraint at each of those locations with the idea that these red dots here, uh, the, this location one is away from the pier. So that placement seven was right over a pier. So monitoring lo location one was away from the pier, but close to a girder. These purple lines represent the girder below it. And then two is away from the girder and away from the pier. Three is away from the girder, close to the pier. And number four is close to the girder and close to the pier. So trying to identify and, and monitor locations where you have different levels of restraint. And the green dots are where the contractor monitored temperature. So in cross-section at each of those four monitoring locations, we had a series of strain gauges, thermocouples, thermistors, and uh, RH probes. So uh, half an inch below the surface, uh, we were monitoring each of those and half, half an inch below the, or above the bottom surface, we're measuring each, each of those. And then same with that mid depth. And we actually threw in an additional thermal couple that's inch and a quarter off the top and the bottom of the deck. Because we're trying to get a profile through the deck, not only a profile of the temperatures, but the strains and the relative humidity. We, we found some very interesting things here. Uh, and, and each of those strain gauges also had a thermistor in it too. So we, we can make, compare the uh, temperatures from our thermocouples. So this picture just shows you what it looks like when it's installed on the bridge. Um, and for the, the strain gauges, we, we built a little, what I call a, a strain gauge bridge. Um, so we've got a top, this is the top strain gauge, middle of the deck strain gauge and the bottom. And, and they're all kind of supported on this bridge. In the relative humidity sensors, we just got a, a tree. So this, this orange, what I call tree, supports the one, two, three relative humidity gauges. And then same with the thermocouple. It's, it's a tree that we've got five thermocouples installed throughout the thickness of the deck. And we, we were out there, again, it was the middle of winter, it was actually December. 
we made sure that the contractor didn't step all over this, right? <laughs> we got a lot of money invested at this point in time. So we, you could see the tape around them and then we stood around each one to make sure that, you know, they, they obviously had to place concrete there, but we didn't want them walking all over this and crushing it. We were successful in doing that. We didn't, we didn't lose one gauge. Uh, contractor was very careful about consolidating around. So it was very successful. So how about our data, data acquisition system? So we had, we had two Campbell Scientific data loggers out there, CR6s. Um, these were all powered uh, by a battery, uh, two batteries actually, and, and two solar panels. And you can see here the two solar panels installed. And this was installed in uh, December 4th of 2019. This system is still in place today. Still recording every single gauge. We have 48 gauges that, that we're running. We're still recording them all. Uh, so it, it, it was, it's a success story, and I'm gonna continue to monitor this uh, forever, <laughs> if I can. Uh, but it was very successful from the standpoint. We didn't lose the gauge. It's powered by the solar panels and we can and it's got cellular communication so we could go to the cloud download the data and our client could view it real time too if they wanted to <clears throat> so let's take a uh, a little bit of a dive on some of the data we collected from the instrumentation and i think i got four or five slides here we can't look at everything but this one is very important um and probably something most of us know, but uh, this, this particular chart here is actually, oops, sorry. We're showing strain from our strain gauges with negative being compression and positive being tension versus time, and uh, that time scale is about 18 months. Um, and, and in terms of the strain gauges, the uh, this blue one, 4-1, is at the bottom, green is the middle, and red is top. Um, and the yellow is the ambient, uh, that's actually ambient temperature, which is very important. So one very interesting thing, and somewhat predictable, is you know we're, we're in a winter environment. It was like negative 10 out there, only place the concrete. Uh, they kept the, the curing, and they were, they were uh, curing and heating it from the underside. Um, which is very important. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And they sl slowly pulled out that heat in about 18 days. And that put the whole deck into compression to the tune of three to 400 microstrain. That has a lot of benefit in terms of preventing transverse cracks, right? We knew that would happen, but not to that extent, three to 400 microstrain. You can see because of that, we really never get into a zone where we're in tension even in the summer months, so this is the winter, this is the summer, it doesn't even go into tension, top, middle, or bottom. As you can imagine, this deck didn't crack all that much. <laughs> um, so uh, th th that was very, I, that was an important finding, and uh, we'll talk about uh, what can go wrong if you heat it from the top side in a minute. But this chart is basically extended out, so this is all 39 months of our data to date. And what we can see here, here is we don't see any, what I call, floating of the strain, meaning we are, we're not going more tension or, or more compression even over after three years. We're seeing mostly fluctuation due to temperatures, right? Uh, and that's an important finding because we're, we're probably done with any cracking that has occurred because of volumetric movement, right? Now we've got corrosion induced cracks to worry about, but uh, in terms of volumetric movement, this tells us in this particular deck, <laughs> we're probably not going to see much more. And, and this obviously includes any drying, shrinkage, the thermal effects, and RH effects. But um, let's see here. Oops. So let's take another snapshot of some of the data we collected. Uh, and this is temperature. So this is temperature at that same location. Uh, and and we recorded, again, temperature uh, throughout the bridge deck thickness, right? Top, middle, and bottom. And we saw this quite frequently. Very significant temperature drops and temperature increases in, in Montana. And Brock being 
a native of Montana, and he understands, especially up in the alpine regions. Montana has a somewhat unique uh, characteristic in their, in their in exposure conditions because of that wide daily variation at temperature, especially up in the mountains. Colorado would be another example of that. But in this particular case, we saw a drop of 50 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit in one day. So what does that do to you know, our strains and the temperature within the bridge deck? Well, it, it puts a, basically a 20 degree F gradient through that thickness, through that deck thickness. And we calculated what that means, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about because we plugged this exact scenario in our FE modeling and we calculated what kind of stresses that would generate. How about relative humidity? Now, we all get rain events in all of our bridge decks, right? Um, uh, there's two things unique about Montana. One is that they also see very large variations in daily relative humidity. And, and, and that ambient relative humidity um, it can be as big as 60 to 70 percent in a day. And that contributes to um, the strains, especially when we get a gradient. And this is just one example where we got a rain, rain event um, prior to a long period of pretty dry weather. And again, the, the, uh, this is the bottom of the deck, the blue is the bottom of the deck, green is um, middle of the deck, and red is the top of the deck. And again, we're measuring relative humidity here. So the yellow is the ambient relative humidity. You can see how we're bouncing up and down. We get this rain event in the top of the deck, which is actually drier than the, the, the bottom and the middle of the deck, obviously shoots up and, and and it's almost at 100% RH as expected during a rain event. But what that does is it creates a gradient again, a, a relative humidity gradient between the top of the deck and the bottom of the deck, um, which we thought was um, uh, important, and we actually modeled this as well. And this is one example. There's, there's other examples where this daily fluctuation comes into play and we get gradients as well. So that's some of the instrumentation data. Uh, the next step in this is we actually did some laboratory testing on uh, typical Montana mix design. So we got all the raw materials um, uh, and they, uh, they sent us all the raw materials. In Montana, they could use, they actually, in some of the cases, they use a very, very hard, uh, silicious, uh, uh, smooth uh, river run aggregate, right? Uh, some parts of the Montana, it's more of a crushed dolomitic limestone. So we did test on both those, but um, uh, this, the idea of this is we could kind of capture the characteristics of the mixes they typically use, and also use that information to input in our model. So we measure compressive strength, flexural strength, modulus of elasticity, uh, pretty much everything you can think of, flexural strength. We all did, we did that versus maturity. And we did that specifically so we could input that into our model because our model operates off of time and temperature history because that affects uh, our physical properties over time, right? And we also measured drying shrinkage. Drying shrinkage plays a big role in this, right? So the drying shrinkage of mix over time, uh, we wanted to know that. And we wanted to know that at varying curing ages too, varying moist curing ages, right? And we did that to help guide them uh, whether they wanted to go seven days or 14 days of wet curing. And then um, we did creep too. Uh, and creep plays an important role in the modeling, especially at later age cracks. So we did creep testing and we loaded these at varying ages. Uh, I think five, uh, we did, it said it right here, five, seven, 28, 90 days. You could tell the creep characteristics changed significantly depending on the age of the concrete i.e. the strength of the concrete. Um, we also measured coefficient of thermal expansion, not only your typical 28 days, but we did it at very early ages too, because the thermal, uh, the importance of the uh, thermal characteristics at early age come into play as well. Uh, and we, we took all that information, we put it in our finite element model. Um, 
And uh, we did a, believe it or not, we did a full model of this entire bridge deck. And we did that at Abacus, um, and it was the same bridge as we instrumented. So we could use that field data to put into our model. Uh, it's a four, like I said before, it's a four span bridge deck, five plate girders, but we modeled the entire deck. Um, and this is just a picture of the model. And with the idea here, again, we modeled the entire bridge deck. We modeled the girders and the stiffeners um, using shell elements. We modeled the cross frame elements. We modeled the deck. We, we, and we modeled um, even the reinforcing steel. So the entire model uh, with the idea that we were focusing in on that placement seven because we had a lot of data for that placement seven, right? So here's a few, we did a lot of scenarios. I'm, I'm somewhat summarizing here. So we did a later age analysis and we, and we did an early age analysis as well. And that's based partially on our findings from our, kind of our, our field inspections and our bridge investigations that we felt some of these are occurring very early. Some of the transverse cracks are occurring at later ages. And then we, we looked at drying shrinkage. We looked at the temperature histories. Remember, we saw some very sharp increases and decreases in temperature that affect the temperature gradient within the deck. We also modeled relative humidity uh, and the relative humidity gradients through the, the deck. Uh, we also measured the effect of wet curing duration, both in the winter and summer months. And we also did sensitivity to deck thickness and girder restraint, among other things. Um, validation of the model, and, and I'm not going to talk about this in detail, but um, we did validate it. So we took temperature data from the field, plugged it in our model, and compared it to what the strain gauge, uh, the strain gauges were reading in the field at the time of that temperature change. And, and it validated quite well. Um, let's take a look at one of our scenarios. So this is uh, a winter placement heating from the top of the deck. Now I think a lot of us know that heating from the top of the deck is, is a no-no, right? Uh, but this, this modeling and actually the data from this bridge deck show that it's not a good idea. Uh, so the, the left chart here actually shows this is actual temperature data we obtained from Montana DOT on one bridge deck that they heated from the top. So they put blankets on the top, heating coils on the top, and we got this data. And, and what we're seeing here is th this blue line is actually the top of the deck, and the orange line down there is the girder. That's very important, and we see a huge temp temperature differential there. Basically, in this scenario, the, the deck is heated up, and, and the girders are expanding and contracting due to the temperature variations, right? And the decks are on, along for the ride, right? Uh, the girders don't care that the deck's there. So what happens is we, we anticipate cracking. This, what this plot shows is that uh, the, um, the, the tensile stresses we model exceed the tensile strength of the concrete. And that tensile strength is based on actual data that we measured for that mixture design. So don't heat from the top. There's some ex exceptions to that if you can monitor the, the, the differential between the deck and the girders. Uh, so we also modeled relative humidity. So we took that scenario, remember I talked about that scenario during the rain event where we had that huge gradient through the, I shouldn't say huge gradient, but a, a gradient through the deck in terms of relative humidity. And we plugged that in the model and, um, and, and what do we see? we see that the bottom of the deck increases in tensile stress by about 300 PSI. The top of the deck actually goes into compression. So when we put that gradient on the deck, because of that radiant, because of that uh, rain event, when you put that gradient on that deck because of the rain event, bottom of the deck goes more tension, the bottom of the deck uh, excuse me, the bottom of the deck goes in more intention and the top of the deck goes in compression to the tune of about 300 PSI. So it's kind of a summary of what we did there. Uh, we, we modeled dry and shrinkage and uh, we contributed about 300 PSI and tensile stress to that. Uh, because of the large temperature rises, we, we attributed as much as 400 PSI and tensile stress on the underside of the deck, same with the RH. So the RH 
could potentially contribute about 300 psi in tension on your side of the deck. Um, and then obviously winter curing. Uh, so heating from below is preferred, um, but not always a possibility, right? <clears throat> so based on that, we had a, a bunch of recommendations. I'm gonna provide a summary here, but the, the three primary goals is to reduce drying shrinkage, like we always do, right? <laughs> and then reduce those thermal gradients, which is not as easy, right? uh, if, if not impossible, and try to reduce moisture gradients too, which is even more difficult, right? So how did we do that? I mean, our next recommendation, some of this is pretty straightforward, pretty common, um, common recommendations. Uh, water smell ratio 0.42 to 0.45. And why do we do that? Well, it's moderately low. Uh, meaning that we're still maintaining concrete that has a very low permeability, resist chloride ingress, but not too low. So over the last 20, 25 years, we've seen a progression to get that water smell ratio down to 0 0.32, 0 0.35. We don't want to do that on bridge decks. We don't want to do that on bridge decks. Um, uh, and that's be numerous reasons, but the tautogenous shrinkage comes into play, placeability comes into play. And then we want to limit the cementition to 600 pounds per cubic yard. They implemented this. Why do we want to do that? Twofold. One, since we've dialed in our water smelt ratio, limiting the cementitious limits our drying shrinkage potential, right? In addition, this requirement also limits the thermal signature of that concrete mix. And that comes into play for the early age development of transverse cracks. If we can lower the thermal signature of that mix, then during the thermal cooling phase, we'll see less tensile stresses in that bridge deck. Especially in Montana when, those, when the peak hydration corresponds to the night cooling, if those two line up, we modeled significant stress gains in that early age concrete that could cause those transverse cracks. And we saw that. So this limits the thermal signature, the use of cement or slag cement of fly ash, same thing. It limits our thermal signature. It also decreases our permeability. It is also green, lowers our carbon uh, footprint, right? Lower plastic concrete temperature uh, for obvious reasons. Um, and then we recommended optimization of the gradation because when we limit that cementitious, there may be some issues with cohesiveness of that mix, placeability of that mix and pumpability of that mix. So uh, optimization, we recommended uh, various techniques to do that. And the largest top size aggregate possible and that and that's not only relative to the cement content but when we have larger aggregates we can reduce drying shrinkage because of the size and shape so what kind of design and construction processes do we embrace? one is insta installation of insulated blankets after peak hydration during the summer now you're saying Todd you're crazy right who would do that why would I do that, right? They did this and have been doing this successfully. And it's eliminated all of their early age transverse cracks. And I, and I, I recommended that, we recommended that um, because of that thermal cooling effect. Uh, the thermal cooling effect in the early ages, if that corresponded to the night cooling, they had issues. So they put insulation blankets down in the summer four to five days until the ambient temperature and the concrete temperature are very similar. They pull them off. Winter curing, we already talked about, right? We already talked about the, the benefits of heating from below, which we kind of knew, not to the extent of what we showed. Uh, heating from the top can be done, but you have to be very careful about limiting the temperature differential between the deck and the girders. Um, and then reduction of moisture gradient. And they're probably, still implementing this. They've done it on some of the bridge decks. Uh, we're recommending they put a, uh, a thin polymer overlay in about six to nine months. That serves two reasons. Um, one, actually three reasons. One is at that point in time, some of the cracks may have already occurred. That thin polymer overlay will fill those cracks, um, preventing chlorides getting in. It also serves as a barrier for chloride ingress for the for the entire bridge deck. In addition, it limits those moisture gradients that we get, uh, especially during a rain event. And some other common uh, uh, 
common recommendations for bridge decks to limit transverse crash. We, we had them uh, do designs of deck thickness of minimum of eight inches. And then we also, uh, for obvious reasons, for the, to pre prevent those holes in the deck, uh, we made sure that they, <laughs> they stagger the top and bottom transverse mats. Um, so we don't get those holes. And, and this shows you a brief comparison of uh, the before and after. So these, th these pictures were taken from the underside of two sister bridges, same design, same contractor, before and after the, our recommendations. And you could see the clear difference in the amount of transverse crack before. And they're about the same age. Now, this guy has cracks since then, obviously all concrete cracks, right? We can't make crack free from concrete, but th these are all taken within a couple months after construction. But you can see the major, major difference and major improvement those recommendations have. And with that, I'll open it up to questions. I would like to thank, uh, I don't think any of my colleagues are here, but Elizabeth Wagner, Jack Dye, Paul Krause, Mohammed himself here, he helped me with the instrumentation, and Isa, who did all the, the modeling for me.